بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Continuing with our book حسن المسلم The du'as pertaining to a variety of situations in a Muslim's life We have today with us the du'a al-khuruj min al-masjid The du'a pertaining to what we say when we leave the masjid We spoke about previously what we say when we enter the masjid Today is what we say when we leave the masjid Firstly, يَبْدَأُ بِرِجْلِهِ الْيُسْرَى the first thing the person does is that he leaves or she leaves with their left foot. Entering the masjid, you enter upon with your right foot. Leaving the masjid, it's with your left foot. ويقول, and then the person says, Bismillah wa salatu wa salam ala rasulillah in the name of Allah and salah and salam upon the Prophet, upon the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Allahumma khfir li dhunubi, Allah, forgive me my sins. Allahumma inni as'aluka min fadlik. Oh Allah, I ask you from your immense bounty and virtue. Allah ma'asimni min ash-shaytan rajim Oh Allah, save me and protect me from the plots of the accursed or the cursed devil. So this dua, this hadith is found in a variety of narrations like Imam al-Hakim's collection, Ibn Majah and Sahih al-Muslim. So the author, he's telling us by quoting this dua that the first thing that we should do when we leave the masjid is that we leave with our left foot. Why is it that you leave with your left foot as opposed to the right foot? Because when you leave from that which is virtuous to that which is less in virtue or to that which holds a very little virtue, you use the left. So we find that the Prophet ﷺ, he would always use the right for things which were virtuous and of benefit and of you know, high standing. Okay, Whereas things which are not virtuous, like cleaning oneself, you use the left hand things which like leaving the masjid you use the left foot why because you're going from the masjid the place of remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and you are now going to the world where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is little remembered and where the world in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala it doesn't have much value in the sight of Allah as in one of the narrations the Prophet ﷺ said though the narration is spoken about has been whether it's authentic or not but the meaning is correct لو كانت الدنيا تعدل إن الله جناح بأوضة ما سق الله منها ما سق الله كافرا شربة الماء had the prophet had the world in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa taala been equal to the wing of a mosquito then Allah subhanahu wa taala would not have given the disbeliever a sip of water but because it means nothing to Allah as well it's worthless in the sight of Allah as well then Allah gives even the one who disbelieves in him that what they want from the world whereas that which is in Jannah where the value is is only for the believer so the person uses the left for that which has no real value okay and it also teaches us and reminds us that where are we spending most of our time we should think when we leave the masjid and we're using our left foot to go into the world it reminds us that we should be careful as to where we spend most of our time and what we are doing with most of our time. We should always choose the deeds which are virtuous, which lead us to huge rewards in this life and especially in the hereafter. So we should be always careful as to what we're doing and where we are doing the activities. So that after stepping out with the left foot, the person then says, Bismillah, seeking Allah's aid and assistance for what we're about to do in the world. Seeking Allah's aid by saying Bismillah, the name which is blessed and when you say it, it brings about so many blessings and ease and comfort for the one who truly understands who Allah is and tries their best to live by the name of Allah Azza wa Jal and by the laws of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. Then you say Wa Salatu Wa Salam Ala Rasulillah. You sense peace and blessings upon the Messenger of Allah Azza wa Jal. Ay Allahumma athni alayhi, O oh Allah how, um, oh Allah, enumerate the virtues of Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and mention the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam in the highest of gatherings that are with you in the heavens. And it's also said in this meaning when you say wa salatu wa salam ala Rasulullah, wa qil ta'adim shar al ladhi jaa bihi wa ala da'watihi fi dunya. And it also has the meaning, which is a very amazing meaning if you think about it, to want to see that the Sharia by which the Prophet ﷺ spent 23 years trying to establish and preach the religion of Islam, the Tawheed, you you hope and you want to see that his call and his dawah and his religion that he came with is established in the earth and given honour and victory and uh, meanings of that nature. So this is something which is very important to the believer, that the believer always hopes 
and wishes and loves to see the signs of Allah in terms of the laws and the rituals that Allah has established for us, the believer is happy and always hopes to see them spread and always hopes to see them be established on the earth. And um, that is something which brings joy to the believer. Uh, and also from when we say it's that we are asking Allah also that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives Muhammad sallallahu wasallam a special status in the hereafter. وَصَوَابْ كَمَا قَالَ أَبُوْ عَالِيَةً But the most correct out of all of these meanings when we're talking about وَالصَّلَاةُ وَالسَّلَامُ عَلَى رَسُولِ اللَّهِ is as Imam Abu Aliya mentioned صَلَاةُ اللَّهِ ثَنَاؤُهُ عَلَيْهِ in the Malaika that the Salah from Allah Azza wa Jal which we are asking for our Prophet Sallallahu to be given is that it is the extolling, the, the mentioning of the virtues of Muhammad Sallallahu by Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala uh, in front of the angels وَالصَّلَاةُ الْمَلَائِكَ الدُّعَى and when we want from the angels to make salah upon Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam we are hoping and wanting that they make dua for the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam so after the person says Bismillah wa salatu wa salam ala Rasulillah the person says Allahumma ghfil li dhunubi oh Allah forgive me my sins so here's something you were in the masjid you just spent time doing good deeds so now why is it that when you're coming out of the masjid after having done good deeds you're going to say oh Allah maghfir li dhunubi oh Allah forgive me my sins you didn't commit any sins in the masjid however that's the nature of the son of Adam and the daughter of Adam is that they are oft falling into sins okay كُلُّ بَنِي آدَمْ خَطَّى وَخَيْرُ الْخَطَّئِينَ تَوَّابُونَ that all of the sons of Adam the children of Adam fall into sins habitually and the best of them are the ones who race to repentance so the person is remembering the reality of their nature that I'm leaving the masjid the place of protection and worship I'm going to fall into sins so I have to seek forgiveness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala continually and also the person remembers that though I've done this act of worship I've done the act of worship in a way which is less than befitting to what Allah azawajal deserves because whatever we do from acts of worship it's never going to be as correct as it should be with regards to what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala deserves from us as worshippers we're always going to have shortcomings when we were praying we were probably thinking of something which which took us away from concentration and khushu in the salah sometimes we make mistakes in the salah in the reading of the quran and the dhikr etc so it's like when you're at work and you have this boss that you really respect and you really appreciate that you have this boss right because he or she takes care of you so whenever you do a project for this boss though you've put in as best effort as you can you kind of feel you know, I could have done a bit more. And you kind of apologize when you when you present what you've done to your boss that, you know, it's it's my best effort. Uh, it's not as great as it could have been. So a feeling like that and to Allah belongs the highest example that when we do an act of worship for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we, we realize within ourselves that it wasn't as complete or as good as it should have been. Therefore, we seek forgiveness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And seeking forgiveness from Allah azza wa jal, is something as we mentioned that we have to do regularly because we regularly fall into mistakes and commit sins but also it brings about huge benefits it brings about huge rewards it removes the sins regularly from us and it brings about the rewards as mentioned the benefits as mentioned in Surah Nuh in the Quran فَقُلْتُ اسْتَغْفِرُ رَبَّكُمْ إِنَّهُ كَانَ غَفَارًا when Nuh salam said to his people I said to them seek forgiveness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because verily he is the oft forgiving يُرْسِلِ السَّمَاءَ عَلَيْكُمْ مِدْرَارًا and if you seek forgiveness from Allah, then He will send um, provisions from the heavens upon you, meaning lots of rain which will benefit you in your life. And He will provide from you, provide for you due to your seeking forgiveness often, provide for you wealth, and He will provide for you offspring. And He will provide for you gardens, and He will provide for you rivers, as mentioned in Surah Nuh. So seeking forgiveness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has many virtues and it's something which is extremely important to do often. And nobody should ever think that they're in a situation or at a point in their lives where they don't have to seek forgiveness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The person then says, Allahumma inni as'aluka min fadlika. Oh Allah, I ask you from your enormous bounties and virtues and provisions that you are often giving to the creation. So the person is asking and begging Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that as you are providing for the rest of your creation that you also provide from me the uh, the rizq, the provisions that you are sharing out continually from your treasures to 
the billions and billions of creation that you have from the time of Adam Islam to the end of time. So Allah Azawajal is in full control of everything that he's created. None can distribute the creation of Allah. None can distribute the gifts of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala without the permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So anything that we want, anything that we desire, we should beg Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for, knowing full well that Allah azawajal is in control of everything in the heavens and the earth, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in the Quran, in Surah Ali Imran, قُلِ اللَّهُمَّ مَالِكَ الْمُلْكِ تُؤْتِ الْمُلْكَ مَنْ تَشَاءُ وَتَنْزِئُ الْمُلْكَ مِمَّنْ تَشَاءُ Proclaim, O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa that, O oh Allah, you are the one who is the complete possessor and complete controller of everything which is in creation, everything which you have created. You give from this creation, from this mulk, whoever you wish to, and you take the creation from whomever so you wish. You give in honor, you raise in honor whomsoever you wish, and you bring down in humiliation whomsoever you wish. In your hands is all good. You, O Allah, are over all things able, complete control over all things. So it reminds us that when we leave the masjid, we say, Allahumma inni as'aluka min fadlik. O Allah, I am seeking from your provisions, from your bounties, from your generosity. And we should know full well in our hearts that all provision is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala what's the point of that number one you're recognizing that Allah his right as the creator his right as the provider you will never seek provisions from other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala you will never beg other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for your provisions and your heart will be attached to Allah azawajal in seeking your provisions therefore you'll never be stressed because you remember that from the day I was conceived in this world from even before that in my mother's womb Allah Azawajal was providing for me and he will continue to provide for me like he did until the end of my lifespan so this takes the person away from being stressed the person knows for sure that his risk is provided for him like some of the Salaf they would say that the person's risk the person's provisions is like their shadow the shadow is always following them and it will never leave them until they die Likewise, your provisions are always going to follow you and you will not leave this earth until you have completed all of your provisions, right? So the person doesn't stress out. However, this doesn't mean now that the person should be somebody who just sits back and relaxes and expects provisions to come to him or expects others to provide for him or her. No, the person has to go out and make the effort. As we mentioned in previous lessons when we spoke about tawakkal, لو أنكم تتوكلون على الله حق توكله لرزقكم كما يزق الطيور تغدو خماس وتروح بطانة in the hadith the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said if you were to rely upon Allah Azza wa Jal with complete and correct reliance then Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala will provide for you like He provides for the birds they leave their nests in the morning empty of stomach and they return in the evening or in the latter part of the day full of stomach why because they went out and made the effort but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guided them and helped them to get to their provisions likewise Allah azza wa jal does that for us so when we say leaving the masjid Allahumma inni as'aluka min fadlik oh Allah I ask you from your bounties it has from these meanings um, and then the person says Allah ma'asimni min shaytan oh Allah protect me from the shaytan al-rajim the accursed shaytan so the believer he knows and she knows and understands that the shaitan's plots are continually being planned for you you're never going to be left alone you're never going to be safe till the day that you die however the more you seek protection from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the more you beg the more you do your good deeds the more you seek knowledge etc the more powerful you will become in terms of preventing the plots of shaitan and the less ability he will have over you however this all depends how much effort you put into it and how much you understand that you shouldn't be relaxed and take things easy in this regard. The great Imam of Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah, Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal radiallahu anhu, <coughs> the Imam of Sunnah, when he was on his deathbed and he was coming in and out of consciousness, right? He's on the stupors of death just before he's about to die. He was heard saying, La ba'd, la ba'd, not yet, not yet. And his sons were around him and other people saying, say la ilaha illallah, you know, it's something recommended to do when the person is dying, that you remind them to say la ilaha illallah. But the Imam was heard saying, no, not yet, not yet. So his son, Abdullah, became very nervous, like, what's happening? Why is my father, who's known to be a righteous person and a scholar, saying not yet, not yet? 
So when his father regained consciousness, he asked him, Oh my father, I heard you saying, La ba'd, la ba'd, not yet, not yet. Why are you saying that? He said, No, my son, it's not as you think. It's not because I am saying, refusing to say, La ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah. It's because I saw the shaitan in the corner of the room biting onto his hand out of frustration and regret, saying, Oh Ahmad, you have escaped me, meaning that you have escaped my plots and you haven't fallen into the traps that I set out for you. So Imam Ahmad said to him, La ba'd, la ba'd, not until my soul leaves my body in submission to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala upon Tawheed. Not until that moment am I able to relax and not until that moment am I able to feel safe from the plots of shaitan. So this is how this great Imam understood the reality of the battle between the shaitan and the believer. And that's why once Imam Ahmad, he was asked, when does the slave find the enjoyment of relaxation and the taste of true relaxation? He said, by putting his first foot into Jannah. Okay, when the person first steps into Jannah, that's when all the stress and everything difficult will be removed from that person and they will totally feel true relaxation. But however, think about his statement. Before that point, there's no relaxation in reality for the believer in his battle with shaitan and his in his struggle and his journey of trying to get to Jannah. If we are relaxing now, it's likely that we're gonna, not going to have enough relaxation in the hereafter. We make the hard work now so that in the hereafter it's going to be easy for us and we will be rewarded by Jannah inshallah. Wa sallallahu alayhi wa Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Anything which I said which was correct was a gift from Allah Azza wa Jal The mistakes and shortcomings were from myself and shaitan And inshallah next week we will look at further uh, dhikr pertaining to uh, important matters In fact we will be taking the dhikr pertaining to the adhan And what the person should say when they hear the adhan and how they should reflect and interact with these amazing words which are heard throughout the world so often. What do they mean and what impact should they have upon us? Wa sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Assalamu alaikum.